to introduce today's keynote speaker, Mr. Rohan Pethia Goda, Ainawid White, Professor Nadira Karunawira, the president of NASSF. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I have this unique honor in introducing today's keynote speaker, Mr. Rohan Pithyagoda. Rohan Pithyagoda had his early education at St. Thomas's College, Mount Lavinia. He later obtained a BSc honors in electrical and electronics engineering from King's College, University of London and an MPhil in Biomedical Engineering from the University of Sussex. Following his return, Mr. Pethiogoda served as an engineer in the Division of Biomedical Engineering of the Sri Lankan Ministry of Health and then as its director. Later, he was concurrently appointed as chairman of Sri Lanka's Water Resource Board. He served as an advisor on environment and natural resources to the government of Sri Lanka and was elected deputy chair of the IUCN Species Survival Commission. In recognition of his contribution to biodiversity and conservation, uh, Rohan Pethiogade was elected a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences of Sri Lanka in the year 2000. In addition to many publications he has uh, made, he has also published several books on freshwater fishes of Sri Lanka, the history of natural history exploration, Sri Lankan primates, Horton Plains National Park and biogeography of Sri Lanka. He's a research associate of the Australian Museum, Sydney, and served as an editor for the journal Sue Taxa. Mr. Pithyogade is a passionate environmentalist and is well known for his work on converting abandoned tea plantations into natural forests, for which he received a Rolex Award for Enterprise. In 2022, he received the prestigious Linnean Medal, considered to be a Nobel Prize for Naturalists from the Linnean Society of London. And he became the first Sri Lankan and only the second Asian to receive this award since its inception in 1888. Several new species of animals have been named in his honor, including two fishes, a frog, a dragon lizard, a jumping spider, and a dragonfly. In addition to his considerable scientific contributions for which he has received global recognition, Mr. Pethiogada, especially in recent times, has functioned as a public intellectual, employing sound scientific rationality and providing much needed critical voice in national affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with pleasure I now invite Mr. Rohan Pethiogada to address this gathering. Thank you, Madam President, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, when I was invited to talk this evening, my first inclination was to look at the challenge of developing policy in a rapidly evolving scientific environment as we saw in the case of COVID. But then I thought it's going to be late in the evening, so I should talk about something a little more controversial. <clears throat> The idea for this talk dates six years back. 
to the day shortly after the Brexit referendum when Britain's new Prime Minister, Theresa May, took office. On that day, shortly after being sworn in by the Queen, stood on the steps of Number 10 Downing Street and she addressed the media, a speech of a few minutes. In the course of those few minutes, she made a statement that startled me. Just happened to see this on the news. If you're a white working class boy, you're less likely than anybody else in Britain to go to university. Isn't that an astonishing thing for a politician to say in a country that is dominated by a white working class? What is it about ordinary boys in England that makes them the most disadvantaged community to make it to university? That piqued my curiosity and I looked at the situation in Sri Lanka. I was astonished by what I found. I looked at the situation in America. I was even more astonished. Then one constituency after another, Western Europe, Singapore, the same story. So I decided this evening that it's time we talked about boys. In Sri Lanka, children in secondary school face their first major educational hurdle when they sit what's known as the General Certificate of Education Ordinary Level at about the age of 16. Here, fully one third of all boys fail. That's almost twice as many. Two years later, the survivors, 70%, sit the advanced level examination. There, more than half of all boys fail. Again, twice as many. By the end of their school career, 70% of Sri Lankan boys are failures. They are what society would call losers. Their education up to that point has made no sense. No contribution, no potential for furthering their careers. A full 15% of those boys fail all three subjects they face. They said, two and a half times. There is a clear differential in gender in secondary school education. Of course, and of course, this translates into university, in which places are dominated by girls, except when it comes to computer science and engineering. The boys still have an edge in the STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics fields. And in consequence of this, people graduating with bachelor's degrees from Sri Lankan universities now have a 70-30 female to male ratio. And that gap is widening. Now, let me stop there for a minute. Um, this is usually a place at which I expected hard objects to be thrown at me. <laughs> because I'm saying something that is toxic, I know, and something that is deeply unpopular. Because the received dogma, the ideology of our time, is that there is no difference in aptitude between girls and boys. I'm inclined to agree with that view, but there is a difference at least in temperament. And that is the point I think we need to recognize. For the past century, ever since the suffragettes movement at about the time of the First World War, we have entered into a age of flourishing of women women getting the vote, women getting into the workforce, women getting parity in education and employment with men. For the first time in human history, this has been a wonderful time to be alive, even as a man, to see what has happened with women. When we look across the various fields of human endeavor, is the situation in America. We see 
women at the top of most fields, excluding some of the STEM fields. Women now dominate the so-called heel subjects, health, education, administration, and literacy. They're at the top. And in Sri Lanka, I'm proud to say, women, especially in science, though unfortunately not in this room, now have as good a representation at the senior levels of research as they do in Western Europe, better than France and Germany, as you can see here. The challenge in recent decades has been to increase representation of women in STEM. And over the four, past 40 years, in the United States, for example, women have doubled their representation. Men, traditionally, were weak in those heel fields, health education, administration, and literacy. They had only about a 35% market share, if you like, in employment. One would have thought that as women entered more into STEM, men would have been able to fill the gap in heel. That wasn't the case. Men declined as well. So what's going on here? I have no idea. I'm hoping you will. Something happens in adolescence. When primary school children finish their primary education, they do so by sitting what's known as the grade five scholarship examination at about the age of 11. And there, there is roughly parity between the genders. Pass grade is about the same. But then, as boys progress into adolescence, they come across a terrible impediment. And so it becomes blindingly obvious when you look at the data that boys in adolescence and early adulthood have a serious learning deficit compared with girls. Now, this is a terrible thing to say, and I want to be clear about one thing. I'm not saying that there is a binary difference in anything between boys and girls. This is a continuum. If anything, we are dimorphic and not binary. We have more in common between the genders than separates us. But still, a small difference can make a huge difference. Because, for example, if you look at the distribution in a random variable, I, I called it attentivity because it doesn't mean anything that it sounds like it does. If girls are more attentive in class, for example, than boys, you'd have distributions like this. And then, when you apply a cutoff, you would have an amplified differential or the genders. So it brings me to an unpleasant, toxic point where I think we have to face the fact in addressing policy in education for being willing to kill a sacred cow and admit that girls and boys do not warrant equal treatment in education. This is a tough one. This is the one that you can't take to governments, you certainly can't take to gender equality NGOs, because we have to live in the framework, the dogmatic ideological framework of having to pretend that girls and boys are equivalent. We all know for a fact that physically we're miles apart on so many variables. I could think of a hundred where we differ, but when it comes to the brain, for some reason, we are required to feel, required to admit, required to confess that somehow the genders are the same. But yet, one neurophysiological study after the other tells us that girls and boys are fundamentally different as their brains develop through childhood, through adolescence, into early adulthood. And we have to conceive it possible that some of these differences will translate into learning difficulties. For example, we know that boys are at two and a half times higher risk than girls of having an attention deficit disorder diagnosis or a reading impairment such as dyslexia. Three times as high risk 
of having Asperger's syndrome, four times as high risk of having an autism spectrum disorder. And adolescent boys especially, I've been one myself at some point, I admit it, have a lot that distracts them. Boys tend to be five times more aggressive than girls, a well-replicated study by the age of 17. But that is 17 months, not years. Even as infants, boys show more aggression. Boys, of course, are given to much more impulsive behavior. This doesn't help when it comes to learning, when it comes to sitting still in class for four hours every morning and paying attention to what the teacher is saying. Boys may be disadvantaged in other ways. For example, not paying enough attention to female teachers now that teaching is dominated by women and thereby not getting good grades. And boys go through life also carrying other burdens. We live substantially less time than women. We have a hugely higher rate of suicide. And we are also given to the consequences of risky behaviors such as smoking, alcohol, drugs, and STDs. Even when it came to COVID, we died at a substantially higher rate. When I say we, I'm talking about men, at a much higher rate than women. Now, how does this translate into real life? You have a huge number of boys who are failing to perform academically. Look at their life outcomes. It's not uncommon. I'm sure all of you sitting in this room know of boys or men of 25, 30 years living with their parents underperforming in their lives, unable to get fulfillment, unable to find a partner for life because no educated girl wants to get married to a layabout man. And so we are seeing a dramatic increase. I haven't got the figures for Sri Lanka, but in the United States of what are now being called deaths of despair. Men who are dying from suicide, drug overdose, and alcoholism. Three times as many as amongst men who haven't graduated high school as men who have got a degree. About 1% of men in, the, in middle age, age 45 to 54, now die deaths of despair. That's one end of the spectrum. What worries me is the ones who don't die, but who choose instead to kill. Because they're the ones who cause societal problems. And the fact is, we need to remember that men are apes. I mean, we're all apes, of course, but, but men behave more like apes, and apes are aggressive animals. If you want evidence from this, from genetics, you need to bear in mind, again, a well-replicated result that each of us has twice as many female ancestors as we have male ancestors. That's a remarkable thing. What happened to the deficit of male ancestors? Many of them probably died in war before they could send their genes down to posterity. Many of them probably died from interpersonal violence. We know that men are horribly violent animals. Many of them were probably excluded from the gene pool, for example, in polygynous environments. But men tend to be nasty when they have nothing else to do with their lives. It's not just men. This is true across mammals. There are very few mammals in which males are not more violent, aggressive, dominant than females. Take dog's best friend. It'll be hard to find a dog owner who doesn't tell you that a male dog is not more dominant, territorial, and easily distracted than a female dog. But males, of course, have positive things going for them. They can be playful, act active, and independent more than females. So the worry I have at a societal level, which is why I think you need additionally to think about policy interventions for this, is that at the other end of the spectrum, the ones who don't die deaths of despair end up in places like this. This is the prison in Colombo, a horrible place. 
95% of the inmates are men. If anyone tells you that men and women are the same, you should tell them, you should ask them why there aren't more women in prison. 95% of all prisoners, 95% of all homicides worldwide are committed by men. And 92% of the prisoners, at least in Sri Lanka, of convicts, didn't graduate high school. An education deficit is not something you want in a society that is looking at flourishing. It is a terrible thing for a country to have. And every time in this country, and in many other countries, when you see young men on the streets rioting, it's always the young men, chances are that they don't have an education that gives them respectability. It's certainly been the case in Sri Lanka. Every time we've had a pogrom against some minority, it's been idle young men at the heart of it. And these young men can wreak the most horrible violence. Now, it sounds to you, I'm sure by now, that I'm running down my sex. I don't mean to do that. Men can also be beautiful things in society. And I was thinking of an example, and I thought of one, and I thought I should mention it. It is that when it comes to spontaneous heroism, men can be the most incredible people. Two months ago, my house in Colombo was burgled, four in the morning. The burglars grabbed some stuff, two of them, and the burglar alarm went off, and so they ran off. They jumped over the boundary wall of my house onto a walking track. There's a popular walking track that runs by my house, and beside the walking track is a canal known as Crocodile Swamp, because there are crocodiles frequently seen in it. This, for the Sri Lankans here, this is in Jayavadanapura, the well-known walking track there. The two burglars jumped onto this track, four in the morning, absolute darkness. There were four young men in their early 20s walking down the same track, returning home from a religious function. They saw the burglars jump and run. They had no idea who the burglars were, they heard the burglar alarm and people screaming, and they gave chase. The burglars jumped into the canal, a deep trench about 10 meters wide, and waded across, absolute darkness. The four men gave chase. The burglars had, were carrying knives. They then climbed into a rice field and ran, again in complete darkness, 300 meters, and the four men gave chase and caught one of the burglars tied him down and called the police, and the police came and took over. Why did four young men do this? It was none of their business. They didn't even know me. It wasn't like they were trying to help me. But there is something spontaneous that happens in men. I wondered how commonplace this was, and I discovered that men, the fact that men are capable, capable of spontaneous heroism in that kind, of that kind, is not unusual worldwide. In America, they have the Carnegie Medal for Heroism. This is a medal that has been awarded for the past century or so, more than a century. More than 10,000 Carnegie Medal recipients up to now. And this medal is given for outstanding heroism. In fact, the medal is awarded posthumously for, to about a quarter of all recipients because they died in the act of heroism. People jumping into the sea to save a drowning child. People running into a burning building to save people in danger of losing their lives. Yet, 90% of Carnegie Medal winners were men. A better known example, the Titanic. Amongst the passengers who survived the Titanic disaster, only 29% were men. They gave their lives to save the women. Men are capable of doing wonderful things. We need them in society. They're important. But we are breeding, we are raising a generation of angry, frustrated men who cannot get a place in the world because the education system is failing them. Now, why the education system is failing them, I don't have a clue. I've been there, but I still don't know. It's only 
now that we realize it, that girls are flourishing in this educational system, of which, of course, I'm proud, I'm delighted. But we still don't want those angry men amongst us. When it came to the Brexit vote in 2016, look at this dreadful statistic. The gap in education between those voting to leave and voting to remain, 30%. Uneducated men were 30% more likely to vote for Brexit. And then people like you who've got a postgraduate degree, 70% voting to remain. Why is it that education is determining political outcomes? It shouldn't. Education have, should have no relationship to political outcomes. Even when it came to the disruptive election of Donald Trump, education was the best predictor by far of people who voted for him and got him to win. It was not income. Last year, it was our turn to get rid of a president. I'm sure you'll have occasion to hear about his policy failures. Almost everything he did was a policy failure. And he had to flee the country. He brought dogma into agriculture, collapsed agriculture. He brought ideology into economics, collapsed the economy. Sri Lanka had to declare itself bankrupt on the 12th of April last year. And when it came to getting him out of office, it was the peaceful protests, largely by young men, who succeeded in changing the system in Sri Lanka. Men can also be a force for huge good, just as much as they can be a force for evil. I urge you to think carefully, because I think this is something that transcends national boundaries. It affects people in all countries. And if we don't pay attention and come up with innovative and imag imaginative policy interventions that bring men back into respectability, not men like the ones in, their room, in this room, because you are the outliers, but there is a broad majority of men, 70%, who are marginalized. And if you marginalize 70% of your country, you can't have a successful next generation. I urge you, therefore, to think. Thank you very much.